Oh. Yeah. Hi, everyone. It's so great to see you. I know this is um, Yasmin and everyone's first event, so I'm super excited to be here. And, uh, and yeah, this is a really great venue, too. But anyways, um, I, I have a, you know, it, it, she just said that I had to talk a lot about animation and that kind of thing, but um, I have a kind of unpopular opinion about animation, especially animation on the web, um, at least for some people. I think we should use animation on the web more. I think we should, like, put more animation on the web. And uh, not, some, not all the people out there agree with me, um, especially people on Twitter. If you want to meet some angry people, just tweet some things. It's very good. Uh, and, and I've noticed, you know, I get it. There's web animation is kind of a bad reputation thanks to things like skip intros and really annoying banner ads that we all totally hate. Uh, but I've noticed a lot of the people that think it's a bad idea to use animation more on the web, they think if we do more animation, we'll end up with an entire internet that looks like this. Um, this is a website, and uh, in this video, I'm um, scrolling to read some content. Yeah, it's going real well, going really good. And then I'm like, what is even happening? And then you get to the bottom, and you get to do it all again, <laughs> but backwards, right? And the thing is, we could. You know, if we all went home tomorrow, and you all made websites like this, and you were like, you know what has to happen? Paragraphs rotate in like this, every single one of them. Like, we could make an entire internet of this. Um, I, I hope we don't. Hopefully, no one has like, just left to go make that internet. Uh, but using more animation on the web could also mean seeing more websites like Stripe Checkout. Um, and if you've ever got used um, anything that uses Stripe Checkout for their payment processing, like Dribbble or anything like that, you've probably used this, um, this interface. And the thing is, there's a ton of animation going on in this checkout. Pretty much every interaction you do has animation on it. And the biggest difference between this and the GoChat paragraph flipping stuff isn't the number of animations, it's the way that Stripe has designed these animations. You know, they've designed these animations to be there for you, the person actually checking out and trying to use the thing, attempting to read content and crazy things like that. And they've also made sure they actually look good, like look like they're part of the design. Uh, Stripe is all about being a little bit subtle, because they could be on anyone's website that you can be using their checkout. So they need things that like, work really well but aren't like, in your face, and they do a really good job with that. So I think using more animation on the web means we can do more stuff like this. And in order to do that, we really need to kind of copy what Stripe's done and get that really good combination of having you know, animation that has a purpose as well as style. Right? Because that's what, that's what makes Stripe work so well, is they have all these animations there for a reason, and they just look really good, and they behave really well. So for tonight, I'm going to talk about animating with style, the second half of that, because I think that's the hardest part for us um, when we work on the web, because very few of us actually you know, have a motion design background. That's not a thing we've done. So I'm going to talk about uh, you know, how we can kind of fake that. So when it comes to you know, designing anything, if you were going to try to design like, a beautiful poster with wonderful typography, you'd probably go and like, look up some rules about typography or like, some type history and use that as a basis to make something beautiful. And the thing is, we can do the same with animation. There are these existing like, historical principles and this whole like, um, you know, decades of craft that have come before us that we can borrow some things from. And that's how we can really learn how to animate with style, how to make animations say the things we want them to say, which will just make us so much better at it. So um, these principles of animation are typically called the 12 principles of animation, and they were written by a little company called Disney, which you may have heard of. Yeah, I figure a few people maybe might have, they've, they've made a couple of movies, not really big ones. Um, <laughs> so Disney wrote this book, uh, I think, I'm not even sure when, a really long time ago. They wrote this book sometime in like around the 80s is when it was released. And this book is how they revealed all of their secrets of how they made animation like be meaningful and, and tell stories. You know, when, they, when Disney and his animators came along to the animation scene back in the 30s, no one was really making movies like they did. And Disney changed everything by looking at animation and asking how could they make this look like it was real? They were wildly successful, of course, and they d summarized how they did it in this book, specifically with the 12 principles of animation. If you're not into books, it's also conveniently summarized in this Tumblr. 
It's weird, right? Because like tumblers are for cats, but this is like real information. It's very useful. Uh, so these are the 12 principles of animation, which often get presented as a list. This is the list in the book, in case you didn't believe me that the book was real. It's a picture of the book. Yeah. Uh, and most of the time when you hear about these 12 principles, they're kind of suggested as like a 12-step checklist you have to do every time you animate something, which sounds really hard and not fun, because we've all got better things to do than like tick off 12 things every time we go. But I think that these 12, these 12 principles are actually like 12 interrelated concepts, and we really don't have to memorize them or even use them all to make better animation. So what I want to show you tonight is taking a simple piece of web animation, something you may have made yourself before, and applying three of the principles to it to make it just that much better, to go from a thing that's just there to a thing that's actually designed and thought about and, and, and been done intentionally. So our starting point for this example is something you may have seen before. It's a modal entering the screen. Prepare yourselves. Seen that before, right? I know, shocking. Oh, slow motion, in case, you know. So this particular modal is confirming our reservation at a cat cafe, and you know, it's just doing its basic kind of stuff. It's animating into view, and we could be like, okay, we're done. You said make it show up, we made it show up, next thing. But I think we can do better than that. So before we dig into changing it, I'll show you what's going on under the hood here. Um, it's all just done with CSS, because I figure if we can make pretty things with CSS, you can do it with anything, right? So behind the scenes in this little animation, we have uh, one animation that's running, or two animations, rather, on this section that's making the modal come up. It's both sliding in and fading in. You will notice my animation names are very cryptic. Never guess what those would do. Uh, and then we also have our, um, our slide-in animation that runs that particular sliding in, and we also have the fade-in that makes it fade in. Pretty simple and not a whole lot going on, but enough that we can work with and, and create something intentional with it. Uh, and if you're looking at this and thinking, like, we could do this with JavaScript or transitions, you could, but we're using keyframes, so sorry. So the first principle I want to try to apply to these is timing and spacing, mostly because if there was only one principle you ever bothered to care about for animation, it would be timing. Like, if you can do timing well, if you can learn to do timing well, you'll probably be a better animator than all of your friends and maybe all of their friends, too. Maybe even your whole town. I don't know. It depends on how many people you know. Um, but timing is really the key to animation and, and the key principle that many of the other principles are based off of. It's a really simple one, a simple one to define, but a really hard one to do well. Like, the only way to get good at timing is to do it more. So it's one of those things you actually have to practice. So annoying. But timing is essentially how long it takes for an action to happen. You know, how fast does it go? How quickly does it happen? How long does it take to do the thing it's going to do? Um, and the most, I don't know, the classic way of showing that is with a bouncing ball. So I animated a bouncing ball for you. Pretty cool, huh? If you haven't seen one before, looks like that. Uh, so it's really just a pink circle moving around the screen, but we've made it into a bouncing ball. And if we wanted to track what the timing of that particular ball bouncing animation was, we could just mark the path where the ball is going, and then actually just kind of mark the timing of each action. And that would look like this. So our, the timing of our ball is just kind of like that dun, 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 right? And those, just that little bit of bouncing tells us a few things about the ball already. Like, obviously, it's pretty light, right? It bounced four times. If it was like a bowling ball, it would have just been like thunk. Like, that would be it. Um, it, you know, it's, it went four times, but the last two bounces are a little closer together, so it's like losing energy. And it started out pretty fast, so maybe someone like threw it, or you know, maybe it's on a very bouncy surface. The other part of timing is spacing. And spacing, like, quite literally, fills in the gaps of timing. It's basically like, since timing is how long something takes, spacing is how it changes speed over the course of that action. And we can record, or we can um, capture the spacing of our bouncing ball as well. So to do that, we just need to take like a freeze frame of the ball at each, each frame of, um, of its bouncing animation. And since the frame rate is constant, we'll get an idea of how the speed is changing. So if we do that, now we can see where the ball was in each particular frame of the animation. And you'll notice at the beginning where it's going faster because it's like heading to the ground, the frames are spaced further apart. And when it gets to the top of those arcs and it's like, oh, going slower, gravity, darn, ugh, they're closer together because it's moving more slowly. So with a constant frame rate, 
the further spaced your frames are, the faster you're going, and the closer together they are, the slower you're going. And that's how spacing gets its name. Because with traditional animation, you were literally drawing the ball at every frame, and that would be really hard and boring. So thank goodness for computers. Whew. So timing and spacing are super important. They're a really important principle of animation. They allow us to like, essentially kind of suggest or fake physics, make things look real. They can also be used to create like, the emotional state and personality of an object. So they're, they're really, really powerful things. And that last point might sound a little bit weird. Like, how do animated things on screen have emotion and personality? That sounds kind of weird, right? But the, the thing is, is when, when we're watching something that's animated, even if it's on screen, even if we know it's not real, our, our habit as humans is to kind of make assumptions about why that thing is moving the way it is. And even very simple shapes moving around, we'll try to guess things about their personality or like their, their state of mind. Uh, there was a study quite some time ago, but it's pretty amazing what they found. Um, a bunch of researchers showed some students a, a, a film strip that looked similar to this. Um, they're just very basic shapes, and the shapes just kind of like animate randomly. Uh, and then they asked the students to write a summary of what they saw. And the students wrote things like, that one triangle was really mean. He was really mean, like a triangle bully. And then the circle was really afraid. The circle was trying to hide. <laughs> you know, all of these things, assigning these emotions to these objects because of the way they're moving, even though we know it's just triangles and circles and lines. But like, I mean, that one triangle was really mean, right? What a jerk. So if we can assume that that triangle is mean and angry and the circle is afraid, like imagine what people think of when you animate things in your interface. We're using the same simple shapes. We are also moving them. So you could totally make like an aggressive, angry button, like the triangle, or you know, like a scared or a happy one. Like that's really a thing you can convey. So for most of what we do, timing is duration and spacing is easing. That's how we accomplish these two. And sometimes this gets to be a little bit, or it seems like a bit of a sticking point, because you're like, OK, cool. Timing and spacing are really important. Timing is how long something happens. That's the duration. Spacing is easing. These are really great for creating emotion and personality. And then you look at CSS, and you're like, I've got five ways to create emotion. Wow, that sucks. You're like, how can I be expressive in this medium with only five choices? Does that mean we only have five personalities for all our animation? But of course, that's, that, that's not, the, not the real thing. Otherwise, this would be the end of my talk, and that would be very awkward. Uh, we do have more than five options. That's where our friend, the cubic Bezier function, comes in. And to be honest, the cubic Bezier function wasn't really my friend when I first met this. When I first saw a cubic Bezier function in my CSS, I was like, yeah, um, that's weird. Like, what is that weird random number barf doing in my code? That's not cool. It doesn't really seem like much of anything. And it's not, it's not how we think about motion, right? Like, when you're thinking about how something's going to move, you're probably like dancing around or drawing it out. You're not writing a bunch of numbers. So thankfully, our, our cubic Bezier functions can be expressed in a more visual way, something that's easier just to think of quickly. So those four numbers are two xy coordinates, and we can take those and we can graph them. Pretty exciting, right? Oh, geometry and math stuff, yay. So we can take those two xy coordinates and plot them on this graph. And this is a motion graph um, of a cubic Bezier function, plotting the progression of our animation against time. And there's two points that are constant here, the beginning one, because our animation does have to start, and the end one, because the animation does have to end. Those are just like the non-negotiable things. Has to start and has to end. But the two points we can change are these two points here, these smaller pink dots. And the way we move those, or when we move those around, we can affect the shape of the curve and create almost any kind of easing we want. So you can go to a place like cubicbezier.com and adjust those handles, make all sorts of curves, get the one you really like, and then you can race it against other curves. Pretty fun. Bring this to the office tomorrow for any of your coworkers that aren't here today, and just be like, check this out, racing curves. Yeah. So with the cubic Bezier function, we open up that door to create almost any kind of easing we want. You know, that's the key to creating motion with you know, that kind of personality, of getting that Im implied physics, of getting the, the, the happy, the sad, whatever other kind of emotion you're trying to get. 
Um, and whether you're doing it within CSS or JavaScript or any of the other things that use Cubic Bezier functions, that custom easing is the way to really create really good motion and uh, expressive motion. So the moral of the story is that everything is better with Cubic Beziers, especially ice cream and pizza. I don't know if that would really work, but you can try it if you want. So if we think about timing and spacing, now that we know what they are, and think about our modal. So our modal right now is just kind of like, here I am, whatever. That was kind of its mood. And the modal itself is on a page with some pretty bright colors. It's a thing that's going to come up. This modal is appearing at the end of like you making a reservation. You've finished a thing. You're probably happy you're done. And it's also confirming an appointment to hang out with cats. So you're probably kind of excited. Or at least I would be excited. If you're not excited, just pretend you'd be excited. So having it, being at that point where you're like, I'm done, I'm going to go see cats, yes! You're, you're, you know, you're in that kind of heightened state, and the modal's just like, here's your reservation. Doesn't really fit. So if we want to make that fit more, a couple of things I think we want to do is you know, make it feel a little lighter, maybe make it a little bit more energetic, make it kind of have that bit of a punch in personality, and, and just also make it feel a bit happier. So there's a number of ways we could do that with timing and spacing. And if, you were, if I was designing this at home, not in front of all of you, this would be the point where I'd probably go you know, to cubicbezier.com or some other editor, mess around with some curves, and find what I like. But that's really boring to watch, so I have brought a curve with me already. And after a little bit of exploration, I decided that this curve was, it was a pretty good one for our modal and would create a little bit more energy. So I took that curve from cubicbezier.com, and I copied and pasted it into my CSS. You can tell, because it's bright green. And there's also an arrow. Oh, no, there is no arrow. Sorry, it's bright green. <laughs> so once we change that one line in our CSS, uh, we get to see our modal be just a bit different. So once we have just changed that cubic Bezier function, our modal now work, um, animates in like this. And I think it's going to be in slow motion too. Yeah, uh-huh. I'm really big on slow motion today. So instead of just being like, oh, here's your reservation, now our modal's like, here's your reservation. And it's just got that little bit more energy to it. Um, even with that uh, cubic Bezier function, it also looks like it's going faster. We haven't changed the duration. It's not actually going faster. We've just changed the rate of speed so much that it, it feels like it has more energy. It feels like it's going a little quicker. And conveniently, by selecting that curve that kind of does that little hop overshoot kind of thing, we've also got our second principle of animation in there, because, you know, I like efficiency. And that second principle is follow through. So by adjusting our timing and spacing, by thinking about our timing and spacing, we got the second principle of follow through, which is what I mean by the fact that these 12 things are really interrelated and not like a list of 12 individual things. So follow through by classic definition is just the idea that not everything stops at once, which is one of those things that sounds really obvious when you read it, but it's, it's actually kind of hard to remember to do. You know, in real life, if you're walking, your arms stop after like, your feet and the rest of you stop. If you have like hair or a giant cape, those will also stop after you stop. I know capes are big, right? Everyone wears capes? No capes, okay. Um, but you know, in real life, things don't all stop at once. But when we're animating things on screen, especially when they're all squares and boxes, we tend to just make them all stop when they stop. So follow through um, is often, I guess the kind of best illustration is like a bulldog with really droopy cheeks. When he turns his head, his cheeks kind of do that after, and then they stop, and they're like, blub, blub, blub. So it can be very squishy. And, and follow through can also be, very, be more rigid. You know, things can be squishy when they don't stop altogether, or they could also be like Roadrunner when he finds some bird seed. So he's not squishy or soft or anything. He's like, oh my god, bird seed. But he's still like his feathers and his tail, they all take longer to stop than the rest of him. So most of us don't really have to animate like bulldogs and roadrunner as our day jobs. If you do let me know, I want to come work with you. Uh, but we're usually doing, or, you know, we're usually animating more simple figures, really, things that are more closer to basic shapes. So for us, follow through really becomes more just literally overshooting your destination, of having so much energy you can't stop in time. So like our modal doing this and being like, here's your reservation. Because it was just so happy, it just could not stop and had to go back. And the easiest way to get follow through when we're dealing with web things is to use cubic Bezier functions that go out of our graph space. So that little upward motion is what gives us follow through. And you can also do it by adding keyframes and adding to the animation. But if you, know, you, know, you want to be a little lazy, just try this first. 
because I, you know, I think that's a pretty good way to do it. So that's two principles of animation we've got going on in our modal. We've changed our cubic Bezier function, put some thought into what we wanted it to look like, picked that um, cubic Bezier, and made it um, you know, have a little bit more energy in creating that follow through. So let's do a third one, because I, I did promise three. So the third one I want to talk about is secondary action, which um, is defined basically exactly how you would guess. It's like any action that isn't the primary action. And you're like, thanks, definition. That was real helpful. Never would have guessed. So it sounds really simple, but secondary action can be incredibly powerful. You know, it's any action that's happening that isn't the main focus, but enhances the main focus and makes it seem essentially like a bigger deal. One place we see this a lot uh, is on Twitter, if you've ever liked to tweet. I'm sure, it probably happens all the time. So the main action in this, like when we like a tweet, we see this animation. And the main action here is the heart scaling up, right? That's the main thing that's happening. But the thing that makes it really satisfying to like that tweet is all the little dots springing out around it and all the circles, like that extra explosion of being like, yes, I like this tweet. It's wonderful. If that's what makes it. That's what makes it like a satisfying thing to do. So that's one way to get secondary action. Um, we could add a bunch of little particles and stuff to our modal. I'm not really sure that would be the most like, best thing to do with our modal. And I hear there's going to be particles later tonight anyways. So I thought of a different way we can get some secondary action. And my idea is to, instead of moving that whole mold, the, the entire modal like it's one piece, like what if we broke up the inside pieces and made it almost like they moved at a different rate than its parent? Like what if we create a kind of more of like a wave-like motion where two things met up at the top and then came down, as if the child elements were being like pulled up by their parent and creating a little bit more of that uh, secondary action to enhance the upward motion. So. I thought that would be a fun thing to do. And also, for whatever reason, I decided I would code it live for you. We'll see if that was a good choice. So uh, here, oh, it's easier if you can see it too. So we got this guy. And here's our cubic Bezier function, just to prove it's the same one. I'll highlight it in green. <laughs> Recognize it now? <laughs> Uh, and so at this point, our modal is just where we left it off, um, where it's just, whoops, that's not the right thing. Um, clicking on this is, we're going to move my laptop up just a bit. All right. So it just looks like that. That's right where we left it. It has a little bit of follow through. It's a little faster, a little more energy. But we want to add some secondary action to make it just a little bit more interesting. So the way I'm going to do that is I want to have our two child elements kind of pulled up by their parent, like they're being dragged up. Like the modal's like, come on, paragraph, we have things to do. That's what they say, right? Um, so to do that, I'm going to create a second animation for our internal pieces, our internal text. Right now, our main modal is being, you know, using this slide-in animation. So I'm going to write a, a second animation that's just a little bit shorter. So we'll start that out. Helps if you even type the right things. And I'm going to call this one slide in short because I'm very creative in my animation names. It's a short version of slide in. You never would have guessed. Uh, and we'll make this one go from a uh, transform of a rotation on the x-axis of maybe minus 15 degrees. Our parent's going from minus 30, so minus 15 sounds good. And we'll go to, um, then we'll also translate it, rather, uh, on the y-axis. And we'll maybe go from like 60 pixels down instead of 400. So it's going from like a little bit rotated and a little bit down. That's where it's starting. And then we'll have it go to uh, transform also of a rotation on the x-axis of 0, like 0 degrees, no rotation, and a translation on the y-axis also of 0. So we're essentially saying go from being a little bit down to exactly where you would normally be. Pretty simple. So we've got our two pieces there in our keyframes. So with that shorter animation, I just need to apply it to the two child elements that I want to have moving at a different rate. So I happen to know that those are an h2 and a paragraph because I put them there. Um, you're just going to trust me on that one. And we'll assign the animation to them of slide in short, the one we just made. Because it'd be really silly to write those entire two keyframes and not use them. It'd be such a waste of time. 
So we'll have it use the animation of slide in short. Um, we'll have it take 0.3 seconds. And then to get that sense of like being pulled up, we're going to delay this animation by just a little bit, um, by 0.15 seconds. That should be a good place to start. Uh, we'll assign this the easing of ease out, which is a custom cubic bezier I have further up on my CSS. And we'll give them a fill mode of both. Then we'll give it a second animation of fade in, just to match its parent, because its parent is sliding up and fading in. And you know it needs to match. It can't only have one animation when its parent has two. That would not be fair. So we'll make this fade in take 0.15 seconds and also delay it by 0.15 seconds. And just to be fancy, we'll ease this one in and have it give it the fill mode of both as well. So that is our title and our paragraph. And then I'll, give us, I'll also apply one to our ticket info so we can have that like wave like of like one, two, everyone down, yay. Interfaces say yay a lot. I don't know if you noticed that. Um, so we'll give this one an animation as well. We'll also give it slide in short. And we'll have this one take 0.3 seconds as well, because we want the animation to take just as long, but we want it to start even later to get that delay of like one, two, down. So we'll give this one a delay of 0.25 seconds, also ease out to make them match, a fill mode of both, and then a fade in animation as well, also taking 0.15 seconds so it matches all of its friends, and delay it by 0.25 seconds as well. That way, on this particular piece, the slide in and the fade in will start at the same time. Otherwise, things might look just a little bit weird. We'll have that ease in, fill mode of both. And then assuming I have not done anything wrong, I can save this and refresh our page. Notice a little difference? We have that little pulling up thing. Maybe we need to see it in slow motion. Probably. Yeah. No one says no to slow motion, right? So there it is full speed. We can just take it down to 25%, let's say. Pretty nice, huh? So now we've got that little bit of both the follow through, that extra energy of going up, and the sense of this kind of wave-like motion to make this whole thing just feel much more organic, feel more like it's alive, like it might be a real thing, um, while also matching that energy and mood. So we did all that in just a few minutes, just a couple of, of pretty simple changes, really, to our animation. And the hardest part is really thinking of it as opposed to executing it. And um, I mean, I think we've really improved it, made it fit the design and fit that energy that it needs. So even something as simple as CSS can use these traditional animation principles that Disney does to make animation just have a little bit more impact and be more considered and deliberate like we do with much of our other design. So, oh, in case you were just wondering what that was. Oh, that's not the way that goes. Try this again. It's funny, I'm like I can write CSS on stage, but I can't figure out how to make Keynote work. <laughs> That's embarrassing. <laughs> um, so we just spent a lot of time looking at one particular animation, which is cool. I mean, it, it got, we definitely improved it, but um, you're probably going to have more than one animation in anything you make, right? Like if you animated one thing in your entire website and nothing else, it might be a little strange. So let's talk a bit about what happens when we have many animations. You know, ideally, you want to spend that kind of time looking at you know, a single animation, but then kind of using the same things you decided for that animation, reusing it on other ones, so you don't have to do that every single time you animate things. And when we're thinking about groups of animations, um, it, essentially, we're, we're being like a choreographer. As opposed to being like a visual designer, we're kind of like telling the things where to go and how to act together, which is essentially what choreographers do. So in, in interfaces, the idea of choreography is really just you know, having some common thread running through all of your animations. Because you never know like, which page of your site someone will start on, which screen they'll see first. If there's some threads going through them all that are similar, if they feel like they're coming from the same place, you're going to have that consistent branded feel, and that'll be really, be really, it just adds so much more to your design. So three things that can help you get really good choreography as you go through and animate multiple things. Um, the first one is to have objects of similar content move in similar ways. You know, if things, if everything on screen is navigation that's animating, they should all animate in a similar way. In this example, we have a set of thumbnails on the right, or on, the, on your left, whichever, um, that come in like this. And they all kind of make sense, right? They're like, doop, 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 we're thumbnails, here we go. Pretty even, pretty logical. But then imagine if they moved like this instead. 
And you're like, wait, why are they doing what? Like, why do they all move differently? Suddenly, instead of seeing a, a list of thumbnails, you're questioning, why, what's going on? Like, are they different? Should they be different? But having that consistent motion and that consistent movement reinforces the fact that they're all the same thing. Another really useful one, rule to follow is to have um, your entrances and form exits. And this doesn't necessarily mean they always have to be exactly the same, but you want a logical reason for why things come and go the way they do. So for example, if we had a little modal that came in from the bottom and then went back out the bottom, we're like, oh, modals live down there. Got it. They're all going to come up from the bottom and they'll go back to the bottom. You get that sense of like spatial awareness and like kind of the map of, of even the things you can't see on screen right now. But instead, if a modal came in from the bottom and then just like went out to the side, you're like, what? why? Like, did something happen? Did I do something wrong? They're supposed to live down there. What's happening? Uh, maybe not quite that panicked. But it does feel a little unbalanced and not really logical unless you have a reason for it changing direction. You know, for example, that modal could have come up, and if you cancel it, maybe it goes down. And if you take some kind of action, then it goes out to the left, and that would make more sense. The third and probably, like, I don't know, most effective one is, is to match your velocities as opposed to your durations. Um, I often see these kind of like very official sounding tweets on Twitter um, where some web developer is like, I've decided all UI animations should take 0.15 seconds, no less, no more, and that is what all animation should be from now till the end of time. Uh, and they pick this one number to make all of their animations be exactly that long. And it sounds like such a good solution, because you're like, yeah, I won't have to think about it again, just 0.15, 0.15 all the time. But the problem is, is when we match durations, the things that we move might move at different speeds depending on how far they go. You know, if you think of animations you might have seen recently, or even the ones we saw in Stripe Checkout, some of the animations were very small rotations. Some of the animations were like really big movements. If those all took the same amount of time, they'd move at very different speeds and feel very differently. So if we had things that are moving at a similar velocity, when we match velocity, we can get things that look more like this. Maybe. There we go. So those two boxes move very different distances, but their top speed looked about the same, right? So they felt like they were the same square with the same kind of properties or personality. So that's, that's what happens if we match velocities. But instead, if you match duration, like those tweets say, our bottom square moves so much faster because their durations are the same, and it, it feels different and feels like it's a different thing. So matching your velocities can make all of your animations feel like they, they live together and they are similar elements of similar things. Uh, it's a little bit harder because there's really no good perfect way to do it without just looking at it, and you know, it's more of an art than a science, but it'll result in having your animations looking a lot more like they are the same things coming from the same place. So taking one more step back, you know, we looked at very, designing a very specific animation and then designing groups of animations. You know, the, the question kind of comes up of like, what do you want your animations to say? Like, what should they say? On our modal, we looked at its context of like the bright colors and the end of the reservation and that kind of celebrated moment. But not everything is going to be that. Like, we kind of need to look at our brands and, and the product we're working on to find a, like, a consistent thing to say with our animations. So one really easy way to, or, or one good way to kind of think about what your animation should say, like, if you get to that point, you're kind of thinking, well, what should my brand say in motion? Like, what, how does my brand move? It's a hard question. People have entire meetings about it, multiple meetings about it even. But one way to get there is to think about the words you use to describe your brand. Like, everyone describes their brand with words in some way. And maybe you might use words like, you know, like playful, oh, that's not the right. energetic, sorry, um, friendly or like sleek, um, strong or playful. I knew playful was in there. I, these are all words you might use to describe your brand or your product. And they're also words you can define in motion, not just in words. You know, you can take whatever those words are, the two or three or however many you, you tend to use, and translate them to motion to inform, you know, how the modals on your site should move, how all the things should move, what emotions and personality they should invoke. 
So for example, we saw this one where we added some follow through and it created a lot more energy, kind of made our modal look friendlier, right? He went from like, here's your reservation to like, here's your reservation. So the friendliness and stuff that we can add with follow through and also anticipation, which is another principle. Just creating those, the kind of overshoot and that preparatory action just makes things have more energy. Depending on how much extra you go or how exaggerated it is, you can create different amounts of energy too. When things squash and stretch, they also have a higher sense of energy and generally kind of become more playful. So a really basic squash and stretch looks like this, where a circle kind of stretches as it's going and then squashes when it gets to the top. And you get the sense that like, it's made of something maybe a bit gooey. You know, creating that softer, more playful feel can create a very different sense of energy and can convey that playfulness or that heightened energy. On the other side of things, if you don't want to be energetic and playful, um, using easing that's, that kind of starts slow, goes fastest in the middle, and slows down at the end, and easing out can feel very settled and very like, stable. You know, unlike the square we saw before that bounced around a little bit, this one's just like it knows where it's going. It's like, this is where I am. This is where I'm going. Feels very certain. It knows exactly where it's going to be. It just it's, does its thing. Getting even a little bit more like calm and subtle, using things that are smaller movements can create a, a more calm feel, a more subtle amount of motion while still indicating the same thing. So like on our modal for our, our, that we were working on, we made it look like it was coming all the way from the bottom of the screen, but it wasn't really. It was really starting like halfway down. But we in created that impression of coming from the bottom by making a smaller movement. And we can make even smaller movements while still implying that same kind of action. So like very small movements upward like that can still suggest that things came from below, even though you didn't show that entire action because that would be too drastic or, or too, uh, too much of a contrast. You can also use things like opacity and blurs to create things that feel very soft and stable. You know, when we're animating, we don't have to animate only position. Animation doesn't have to be motion. If you just kind of blur things in and out or just work with the opacity, you can create some, com something that feels very calm and very stable because it's not moving around, but you still have animation and can play with depth and time. So you can still do a lot while not even moving at all. So this all kind of goes to the idea of you know, aiming to create your own animation library. You know, decide what it is your brand wants to say or what it you know, find out what you, what you want it to say. Play around to figure out how that could be expressed in motion and then reuse those same easings, those same cubic bezies over and over to create you know, a consistent feel across all of your animations and your site or your brand. And it's a, really, it's a really simple way to just create that common thread. And then you don't have to think separately about each animation every time. You, know, you save yourself all that effort of every time you have to animate things, being like, oh, what should it say? What easing should I use? You can decide that ahead of time and just pull from your own like, short list of things that you know work really well. So one last thing I want to talk to you about tonight is the idea of finding really good motion inspiration. You know, I said at the beginning that it's hard for us as web designers to do motion sometimes because we have no background in it at all. You know, we just, it's not a thing we've really had to think about. So I think it's a really great idea to, like, to look for motion inspiration and create your own opinions on what kind of motion looks good, what good motion looks like to you. So I have three favorite sites for inspiration of places you can start. The very, very first one is Art of the Title, which is a whole site um, dedicated to TV and movie title sequences. Uh, they have a bunch of ones, like anywhere from really old classic ones from Saul Bass to like movies that came out yesterday. Um, maybe not yesterday, but like this year. And they interview the designers behind them, talk about why they made the things the way they did. It's super interesting and lots of really great inspiration there. Another one is Captivate.co. It has two Ps, which makes it hard to find, but that's okay. Um, this one is more about, um, it's a collection of like iOS animations. And the thing I really like about this one is uh, the girl that runs it, she always picks multiple animations from the same app. So instead of seeing just like one awesome transition from some app, you see like three. And then you can start looking at that and thinking like, do all three of these animations in the same application make sense? What kind of common thread do they have? And you can kind of start judging it that way, which I think is really valuable. And then last but not least, um, 
userinterface.io or UII.io focuses on, web, on, on website animation. They have a whole collection of web-based animation, and they put it into categories, which makes it really helpful. So if you're ever like, ooh, I need to do a drag and drop animation, I have no idea what to make it do, you can go to this site and see like 50 different versions of drag animations just to give you like that kind of a place to start from so you don't have this like blank page stress. So, that's a pretty good one, too. So between those three, it's a good place to start. And of course, there's plenty of other places to find really good motion on the web, or anywhere, really. You can take a look and, and find the ones that speak to you most. So um, if you are, if this kind of talk about interface animation is something you're into and you want to find out more about, um, I wrote a book. It is approximately the size, or half the size, of a small dog. Uh, and it's all about designing interface animation, all this stuff and more. Um, since you hung out with me tonight and listened to me talk about it for uh, this evening, you can get 20% off with my name. Um, but the dog does not come with a book. Book only, no dog. Yeah, she's mine. <laughs> So thanks so much for talking animation with me tonight. I'll be here the whole rest of tonight. If you have any questions, come find me. I'm happy to talk about this all the time at any time. Thanks so much.